With this combination of sand and cinema, you'll have a ball on this special sneak previews. I never knew it could be like this. Nobody ever kissed me the way you do. Nobody? No, nobody. And nobody who ever saw From Here to Eternity can ever forget that scene with Burt Lancaster and Deborah Carr, of course, the most famous beach moment ever captured on film. And this week, as you can see on the special sneak previews, we take an affectionate look at all the sun and the fun in beach movies over the last 36 years. I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And I'm Michael Medved, and I've always wanted an excuse to dress like this in public. And the whole craze <laughs> for sun and sand cinema actually began innocently enough back in 1959, when one fictional 16-year-old tomboy decided that she would do absolutely anything just to learn surfing and to hang out and hang 10 as one of the boys. <laughs> Sandra D was the original Gidget in the first of six films about the girl whose insulting nickname is actually short for Girl Midget, and who, courtesy of some dazzling special effects and a suitably modest bathing suit, can shoot the curl with her hunky co-stars, very young Cliff Robertson, and the perpetually smiling James Darren, a beach movie regular. A year later, Where the Boys Are focused on college kids in Fort Lauderdale for spring break, where co-eds Dolores Hart and Paula Prentice are impressed by the sophisticated wit of two of the boys they've found, Jim Hutton and future tanning champ George Hamilton. Two days left in this vacation. Two days. Snow and ice, Dr. Ronch and the Dean. Oh, Ryder. Be comforted. TV has an announcement. Students, in view of the impending disaster, we are about to start living it up. And Elvis certainly lived it up in Blue Hawaii, where the king and his court had a blast kicking sand on the beach. And it was certainly the name of the game for Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello, who managed to revive their fading careers by teaming up for a seemingly endless series of beach party movies, which used fresh-faced enthusiasm to make up for any lack of musical or athletic ability. The plot, such as it is, kicks in when an aspiring singer supposedly skydives into the ocean as a publicity stunt, and Frankie rescues her. Perfect. Hey, look, if I put my arm around someone, I'd like it to be my idea. You're a hero, boy. You just saved a beautiful young girl from the jaws of the deep. Got that, Earl? Jaws of the deep? Yeah, I'm gonna keep that one for my wallet. I have a feeling she didn't need saving. Yeah, but Frankie might. Come along now, and let's uh, get out of these loose clothes and slip into something tight. See if you recognize the blonde beauty who suddenly steals our hero's attention from former Mouseketeer Annette. Just think of me as your father. That's right, it's Linda Evans, more than a dynasty before she eventually won great fame on television. Now I think we're ready. Now that's what I call a healthy girl. Sugar Cane, doing her first free fall in honor of her album of Sky songs, Come Fall With Me. But no beach party movie would be complete without its comical villains, the tough biker gang, 
led by the formidable Eric Von Zipper, What's played, that, of course, by Harvey Lembeck. I'm thinking. How long will that take? Until I get it sunk. Ah! Some 20 years later, Frankie and Annette reunited for Back to the Beach, a slice of nostalgia whose title we borrowed for this show. They're now middle-aged, middle-class parents from Ohio who go back to California to visit their daughter. But wouldn't you know it, Frankie meets an old flame, Connie Stevens, who's thrilled to see him. Honey, you are still the best-looking thing on this beach. Somebody get me a net! <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, uh, Connie, you remember Annette, huh? Well, I didn't mean that kind of Annette. Aren't <laughs> <laughs> you still dating? Oh. oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, you look great, too. Not this great, <laughs> but great. <laughs> well, I try to take care of myself. I, I eat right, and I get plenty of rest. Of course you do. It's because you're boring. Hey, <laughs> 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 To give this picture a strong contemporary edge, Pee Wee Herman turns up to perform the deathless ditty, Surf and Bird. Back to the Beach is, in fact, the only film in history ever to feature both Pee Wee Herman and O.J. Simpson, who makes a cameo appearance in another scene. But Frankie is still the star, showing he can still surf in front of process shots just as brilliantly as yesteryear, and impressing his family by displaying the admirable cool he always shows when he wins the climactic surf off. But if you like real surfing footage, it doesn't get any more spectacular than Endless Summer 2, where truly amazing camera work makes this one sequel that's even more fun to watch than the original. I call them the varsity. Local boys like Johnny Boy Gomes, Michael and Derek Ho, Liam McNamara, Sonny Garcia, Larry Rios, Jerry Lopez. These guys are pipe specialists. If you think you're gonna hop off a plane from somewhere, go out there and dazzle someone, you're in for a very humbling experience. You know, after watching Endless Summer 2 again, Michael, I almost want to go down to the beach with a surfboard. <laughs> I am not a surfer. I stay in the pool. The fish swim where they swim. But you get a sense of watching Endless Summer 2 of the danger of the sport and how it's evolved from those early surfing movies where it's so tame and they paddle yeah. out and they ride in to a movie like this. What's well, an amazing piece of work. I mean, they obviously mounted a camera on a surfboard and did have the effect you mentioned on me. After seeing the movie, my wife and I went surfing with boards for the oh, very first time I ever in Hawaii. That. Why couldn't but we have filmed that? She was good. I wasn't. <laughs> but the, the fact is what's amazing about all of these films when you look at them together is the innocence that comes out. I mean, Gidget is 16, year old, 16 years old. Her parents are worried about her spending too much time down at the beach. And Frankie and Annette are constantly singing and twisting, of course, but they're basically very innocent kids. They never do anything other than kiss, roast weenies, and play volleyball. You know why? Because at one point, Gidget said, surfing surpasses every emotion I have, every other emotion I have. And she says if she can only get a surfboard, which, by the way, back then were huge boards compared yeah. to today's. She, see, I know about surfing, right? Right. She, she says uh, uh, surfing is a guilt edge guarantee to happiness. I mean, what else is well, there it, in life, it, right? It sure is, especially if you're Sandra Dee. I think that's her greatest role. She's very, very very good in the movie and it's interesting that so many of these movies came out between 62 and 65 there were a hundred beach films and during that time period this was a time when they emphasized innocence because what was going on in the real world with sex drugs rock and roll Vietnam just kicking in the real world wasn't innocent at all and people felt very threatened by it so this was a terrific escape to go down to the beach all the people on the beach are about the same age except Cliff Robertson who's a little bit older and uh, they're all white they're all middle class and all they care about they have this little community on the the beach is just completely devoid Except from reality. Except for the comical bikers who always turn up. And of course, you should say in Beach Blanket Bingo, there's also Buster Keaton and Don, Don Rickles, Rickles right. right? I mean, un unusual who cast. Looks at, uh, who looks at them and says, you're too old, you're 43 <laughs> years old. Anyway, summer and beach movies mean parties and fun. But there are also some serious or nostalgic films dealing with relationships and a loss of innocence. Sandra Dee made such a movie the same year she played Gidget. But in a summer place opposite another young actor, Troy Donahue, not even Max Steiner's famous score, could hide the clumsy dialogue they recite to one another on a rocky beach off the coast of Maine. 
Smells so good. I washed my hair for you. I knew we'd be together, so I... I love you, John. I love you. I love you so much I ache inside. I feel the same way too, Johnny. Meanwhile, in a nearby beach house, his mother and her father, Dorothy McGuire and Richard Egan, rekindled their long-ago summer affair, though they're now inconveniently married to others. I'm perfectly willing to come to you whenever you want me. All summer? All summer. What about the winter? All the winters. All of our lives. I'm not as pretty anymore. I'm sorry for that. I love you too much to speak. Another movie with a memorable score was The Wistful Summer of 42 in which a nervous teenager, Gary Grimes, struggles to make conversation with a lonely beauty, Jennifer O'Neill, whose husband is away fighting in World War II. The tide's coming in. Yeah, so it is. Have any other heavy objects you want moved? Oh, no, none that occur to me. Well, if you can think of any, feel free. All right, I will. Thank you. Will you be at home tonight? Pardon? Well, I thought I might drop by. I have to be in the neighborhood. Feel free to drop by. Another older woman has captured the attention of another awkward teenager, Jonathan Silverman, in Stealing Home. Here he's urged on by his friends, including Jody Foster. Yeah, I'm a woman. I know these things. <laughs> oh, boy. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Alan Appleby. You have peanut butter on the corner of your mouth, Alan Appleby. Oh, God. You're the boy who watches me every night. No, no. It's I... all right. I like it. You do? I missed you last night. Yeah, I was there, really. <laughs> I know. I was only kidding. <laughs> oh, <laughs> kidding. Can you make it tonight? Tonight? Um, let me see what my plans are. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can make it tonight, sure. Great. I'll make it special. Special? Oh, my God. Shag is set in the summer of 1963 and is sort of a southern pride version of where the boys are since it takes place in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where four girls have headed for a wild weekend of fun just before going to college and marriage. One of the girls, Bridget Fonda, has entered a beauty pageant and hopes the judges of the talent segment appreciate her as much as her friends do. I'm 18, and my talent is dramatic interpretation. Yankees and Tara? Well, I won't think about it now. As God is my witness, as God is my witness, they're not going to lick me yet. As God is my witness, if I have to lie, or steal, or cheat, or kill. I'll never be hungry again. Oh. 
The Flamingo Kid is also set in that summer of 1963, but this time at a beach club on Long Island, where an ambitious cabana boy, Matt Dillon, becomes a protege of one of the guests, wealthy car dealer Richard Crenna. I'm going to take that, and I'm going to knock with seven. Ah, Hawk, I think you're bad luck. Lay him down, kid. Read him and weep. Oh, yeah, there's the old king you were looking for, yeah. Let's see. My queen on your jack, my jack on your ten, my four on your fours. I had to knock you with five, Mr. Roach. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Sam. It gives me 20 points for the end of knock, plus two. It's 22 points. Yes, he's hot. I taught him everything he knows. Back off, back off. Your deal, sir, I do believe you play loser deals. Whew, hot, hot. Ooh. Ooh, boy. Oh, we should have brought shoes. Ow. Daddy, I can't walk in there while I see the bird. Okay, just hop, honey. Just hop. Now, space on a beach can be at a premium, especially if you have to accommodate a body like the late John Candy's. In Summer Rental, directed by Carl Reiner, he and his family are on vacation in Florida. But everything goes wrong, especially for the beachgoers unlucky enough to be in his path. I'm sorry. Really? I didn't hey, there was my hand. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Really? Oh. Just saying. Oh. Fine. Oh, oh, oh! Oh, oh. oh. oh it's a giant cooler. The thing broke off again. I'm waiting for a part from Minneapolis. Holy oh, hey. oh, 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 your, your foot, lift up your foot. Oh. My land, you're getting sand in my land. If there's any damage to it, tend to build a 415 beach lane. All right? You're damn right. I don't think I heard it at all, though. You big poser. Hey, what are you doing? Let's go look. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, watch it. That's my hat. Hey, honey. Go on, chicken. Go. Sure. Oh, sorry. Sorry, girl. Sorry. Just ice water. Just ice water. Hey, what are you doing? All right. Well, you should have put a cover on. Yeah, look. Don't you watch me walking? No, watch it. Well, you shouldn't be cooking on the beach. It's illegal, I think. Where's your mother? Sandy! Dad! Can you hear me calling you? Get all over here. I enjoyed watching Summer Rental again. It can't help but remind you how much we all miss the late John Candy. And it also reminded me a little bit of a wonderful French film called Mr. Hulot's Holiday with Jacques Tati. Another film where he goes off for what he intends to be the perfect vacation, but everything goes wrong. And even in that kind of vacation, when it's a beach movie, there's sort of an air of nostalgia about it because he's this precious moments in the sun which are supposed to last you for the rest of your life. Another film which comes to mind in these sorts of movies is Lifeguard with yeah, title player movie. Sam Elliott. Yeah, tutoring a protege and how to be a lifeguard year after year on the beach. But talk about nostalgia. Summer of 42 is one of my favorite all-time films. It created the aura of 1942 and the loss of, the, of, of youth and this uh, Gary Grimes loving uh, Jennifer O'Neill from afar, this unattainable woman. But I gotta tell you, the one I identify most with is Flamingo Kid mm -hmm. because I was there at the, the Atlantic Beach Club <laughs> in the summer of 1963. Here comes the nostalgia. Yeah, and I saw people playing, sitting around playing Pinochle and Canasta all summer and it captures that perfectly. And there's a wonderful scene in the movie in which Matt Dillon's father, a plumber played by Hector Elizondo tells him, you must go to college. Don't go to work for this guy selling cars, because that's mm -hmm. where your life will end. And it's a wonderful undercurrent to the film that gives it a serious tone. Well, it is it's a very serious film. It has that whole theme between the integrity of his working class family and sort of this flashy, nouveau riche artificiality that's represented by Richard Crenn. It's directed by Gary Marshall, mm -hmm. who also co-wrote it, sort of the first film where, where he was shown as a serious talent. And speaking of serious talents, Bridget Fonda made such isn't a she, strong impression she in wonderful? Shag. wonderful? Absolutely. She's there with Phoebe Cates. That's a film that's a little bit like America and graffiti, it's sort of their last fling. They're telling people, their parents, they're going off for a tour of Fort Sumter, but they actually go to Wild Myrtle Beach. And one of the boys in the movie is played by Tyrone Powers' son, and they're not going to marry, is she, she going to marry him, or is she going to go off on a fling? I really like this I think this we film. can explain yeah. that Shag, the title, refers to a dance craze peculiar to South Carolina mm -hmm. in that summer of 63. Well, now most of the time we associate the beach with that kind of good time, or romance, or nostalgia, but Hollywood also reminds us that every once in a while, danger can turn up at the shore. Now, of course, Jaws is the most famous example of this sort of seaside shocker, but even more terrifying was a notorious mid-60s chiller called the horror of Party Beach. <laughs> the grainy black and white photography only heightens the feeling of gripping realism as revelers rock out to the big beat sound of a group known as the Fabulous Del Airs. But the golden youth on Party Beach 
don't know what terror lurks beneath the waves. The New York Times responded to this movie by saying, the only question about the horror of Party Beach is which is more horrible, the monsters or the rock and roll. A pair of radioactive atomic zombie sea monsters that look a bit like ambulatory artichokes attack a series of unsuspecting nubile victims, eventually displaying their fearsome light bulb eyes and sausage teeth. Monster from the Surf, also known as Beach Girls and the Monster, uses a similar setup, though this time the deadly creature from the deep is actually a middle-aged oceanographer who dresses up as a monster and murders beach girls in order to discourage his son from hanging out with surfers. Actually, their dancing and the music by Frank Sinatra Jr. ought to be discouragement enough. Surf Nazis Must Die featured another sort of beachside horror with a band of Aryan thugs led by characters cleverly named Adolf and Ava who determined to take control of the beaches in an earthquake ravaged California. Samurai surf. Ding of us. Terrible lip syncing is more of a threat to them than any rival surf gangs. <laughs> Hook. What seems to be the problem? No problem comes. You know, with a title, Surf Nazis Must Die, it is so unabashedly tacky. It's I'll unpretentious, say. and if you're in the right mood, whatever that mood is, and nobody's saying you should be in that mood too often. I hope not. It's uh, tacky fun, just, despite what you might expect. I had a good time watching it, particularly seeing actors whom you've never seen before and will surely <laughs> never hear of again. Yeah, playing characters named Adolf, Ava, and Mengele, leaders of this gang of surf Nazis. Look, the fact is you have to have a certain appetite for some slasher mm -hmm. scenes, some pretty harsh violence, which is an acquired taste, I guess. <laughs> and this is from the Troma filmmakers, makers of such fine films as Toxic Avenger and Mania nurses in ecstasy class of newcomb high another th one that one too but the real gem for me here in this bunch is monster from the surf and not just what's up there on the screen but the story behind the film because it's the work of ramar of the jungle john hall who starred in that old tv show was a big star of sarong and jungle movies in the 1930s like hurricane with dorothy lamour his career was washed up and he was at home tinkering with camera equipment was known to have some of the best camera equipment in hollywood the producers of the film came to him wanted to rent the equipment he said, no, I won't rent it, but you can have it for free if I can direct the movie. So he did direct it, and he played the rather overweight monster oceanographer himself. But he didn't give them all that they expected, because about <laughs> halfway through the movie, if you recall, didn't it strike you as odd? There's about 20 minutes of surfing footage, 
And I'm saying, I guess they're trying to pad it out because there's they nothing sure on are. either end of the it, movie. It's stock footage because <laughs> Hall only had 60 minutes of usable footage. It wasn't <laughs> enough to release it. But talk about not enough to release it. When you talk about the horror of Party Beach, you're talking about <laughs> one of the great all-time right. bad movies. I mean, first of all, Party Beach is Stamford, Connecticut. It looks perpetually cold and rocky. Right, when and, and then the way they kill these monsters who are supposedly unstoppable, at the end, they throw salt on them. It's right. genius. When you think of beaches and surfing, you think of Stanford, Connecticut. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> not Malibu, not Waikiki. <laughs> Stanford, that's the place. So that's it for this week's special show, Back to the Beach, wherever that beach happens to be. Please join us next time when we go back to dry land to review all the new movies in town. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And until next time on Sneak Previews, don't forget to save us the aisle seats.